So ours is all about identity, whereas a forensic pathologist will more often be focused on the cause of death and the manner of death. We're really interested in who was the person when they were alive. Which is, I guess, what you did when you went to Kosovo, for example, that was exhuming many, many bodies. What was what was that about? That was, I mean, it was one of those pivotal moments in both my career and personally, where it just had so much impact and will never, never leave me. And it's something that I'm very grateful for having mm. experienced. But my goodness me, was it a sobering experience? And, you know, like everybody else, I watched what was going on in the Balkan region um, towards the end of the 1990s uh, with mm. horror and didn't expect that I would actually go out there. But I got a phone call one Wednesday afternoon from Peter Vanessa, who was a pathologist who was out there. And Peter had said to me, what are you doing on Saturday, Suze? And I thought, oh, that's nice. He's, he's asking me for dinner. And he wasn't. <laughs> he was saying, that's great. I've got was tickets for you. You're flying. No. Um, oh. He's a pathologist. Um, <laughs> and he said, you're flying out to Kosovo. And so I didn't really know what I was going out there to do. And um, when I arrived, we, we flew into Skopje, obviously, because you couldn't fly into Kosovo. And once we got to the scene, it was something that I'd never experienced before. We had 43 men um, who'd been herded into an outhouse and they had been shot with Kalashnikov fire. So the room had just been sprayed oh. with fire. They had stood at the window and thrown in straw and thrown in petrol and torched the building. And so we, we came along probably about nine months later. And so mm. what we were looking at were 43 men, and you're a man if you're 14. So the youngest person there was 14, in two rooms. They'd, they'd got into the corners of the room because if somebody comes into your room with a gun, you try to get as far away from them as possible. So everybody had huddled together in the oh. corner. And of course, as they died and fallen, what you have is um, you have the bodies lying on top of each other. And after nine months and 30 odd degree heat, the decomposition is extensive. And of course, they were also partly bur um, burnt. And because the building had been torched, the, the roof had come down. So they were partly buried under roof tiles as well. And the, the refugees, when they left, fleed the country, didn't take their dogs with them. So the dogs were roaming around like wild packs. And of course, mm. this was a food source for them. So for us, it was these badly decomposed, partly dismembered, um, partly burnt and partly buried bodies. That was the first thing that we saw. And our job was to try and, and sort them out, try to find out how many people were here. Were they men or women? How old were they? How did they die? And, you know, it gone, gone as the image of having a nice CSI type mortuary with, you know, shiny stainless steel. Yeah. There is no mortuary. There is no running water. There is no electricity. You're doing the post-mortems on top of a plank of wood out in the open air, but you're having to do it at the same level of forensic um, yeah. attention to detail as would be expected of you if you were in the best facilities in the world. What sort of things give away uh, who these people are? Are you able to actually identify the person? So the first thing that happens is that when, when you have an indictment site like that, it becomes much stronger evidentially if there is a survivor. And there was one survivor. He had got, been in the corner of the room and everybody in front of him had taken the bullets. He'd survived. And he had to lie underneath the dead bodies of his family <sighs> and his colleagues whilst they burnt on top of him. And he was very badly burnt, but he survived. Oh, now that God. meant that what we had was a witness. And the witness therefore had a test testimony who said this is what happened these are who the people were our job as the forensic team is to go in without that knowledge but to say what do we have here what's the evidence here are these men are they women are they children are they old people have we got evidence of gunfire and if our forensic evidence matches the witness statement, then when you get to court, what you have is a really strong set of, of evidence that you can put um, in terms of the prosecution. But our, our job is, first of all, to try to separate these bodies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you decompose, little bits will filter down from one down to the other. And so it becomes oh a God. bit like a three dimensional human jigsaw. And you need to try and take one person out at a time and say, well, this is male. This is a male who's young, probably between 14 and 16. 
who do we know is missing? Because people will come forward and say, these are the people who were on that, that refugee train. And we can then trace their family members, existing family members. We can take DNA samples from their family. We can take DNA samples from the bodies and we can see if they match. And that's how we'll eventually get down to a name, hopefully.